This is the You Show Podcast. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the You Show Podcast. I'm Chris Treft, along with Ben Gisselson of the Des Moines Buccaneers. And Jay Verity is our guest today, Ben. Jay Verity was a fabulous interview. It's always a pleasure to sit down with coaches, Chris, because not the players don't have a lot to pick from their brains, but coaches are obviously, that's all they do, right, is think and think on hockey. So to talk to him about coaching style, to talk to him about some of the players he's gotten to coach over the years, obviously the great success he had in Sioux City. And speaking of great players he coached there, you think about Ellie Tolvanen, Matisse Kivlenix, two guys that absolutely just lit up the USHL when they were a part of the league. So I really enjoyed this one, and Jay seemed to enjoy it as well. We had some good laughs, and so this is one that I think the fans will get some good laughs and some really good information out of as well. You can certainly tell why he climbed the ladder so quickly from the USHL so rapidly to becoming a head coach in the American Hockey League, and I don't expect him to be in the American League for long. He's a, a National Hockey League mind, to say the least. That's how good he is, and he got his start in the USHL. So let's hear from the man himself, head coach of the Tucson Roadrunners, Jay Verity. We are joined by the current head coach of the Tucson Roadrunners in the American Hockey League, Jay Verity. Jay, how are we doing today, my friend? Good, you? Doing very well, just, you know, finding things to do. And we started the, the or we reincarnated, quote unquote, the You Show podcast. We've been having some fun with it and you're our, our guest for today. And we're really happy to have you on. Yeah, thanks for having me. So we'll start off uh, with your, your current situation. Tucson, you guys are, you know, you had a heck of a season before everything halted and everything. But, you know, you spent a, quite a few seasons in Sioux City. You made the climb. And uh, it's your second year in Tucson. How's everything going uh, down in down in the desert? That's great. Uh, we had a pretty good start to the season, and we were looking forward to that last push. We had about 12 games left. Curious about the change from you have amateur players in the USHL. Uh, you kind of get the in-between kind of amateur, kind of professional with major junior players that you coached in between the USHL before the AHL. What's been the transition like for you handling professional players compared to more younger kids in the uh, past before you got into the AHL? Uh, for me, it, it's pretty similar, to be honest. I think it's about just relationships, finding uh, some common ground for everybody to talk about because more than anything, these are, these are people coming to work. Um, you know, everybody thinks about the hockey player, but a lot of times it's, it's the person behind it and, the ability to just talk to those guys. Um, I think my, my past in terms of where I've coached, the different places I've been has created an opportunity in the American Hockey League to, to talk a lot about uh, the players that, that we're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis and uh, kind of developing that relationship, that trust that needs to be there. Take a step backwards then. I, I want to talk about Jay Verity, the player, a little bit before we talk about Jay Verity, the coach, because – you had some time in the USHL where the really the numbers that stood out to me was the 389 penalty minutes you had in two seasons with the Dubuque Fighting Saints. Going back to Jay Verity, the player, did you consider yourself an enforcer or was it a, a kind of a hybrid role? What was Jay Verity like with the skates on on the ice in Dubuque? This is uh, this is a pretty interesting question. I haven't talked about Jay Verity, the hockey player, uh, ever. I think so. <laughs> All right, a first year. All right, that's I'll, why we're here. We're, that's why we're, we're here. Gonna, okay. Well, we're really going to dig into this one. Um, you know, uh, that time in Dubuque, for me, I was just an average player, so I had to find a role. I had to find a way to, to add something to the team. And for me, I guess, collecting a couple penalty minutes is, is how I was able to do that. Um, that time uh, in the USHL, it was, uh, it was a little different league than it is now, and I think all of it's for the best. You just said – it's a little bit different of a league from when you played now and you know you coached recently as well so what are those differences what has changed and what has evolved since you became a player the good things of junior hockey is just you know players getting away from home a chance to live with a billet family a chance to play with players from all over the country and the world for that matter uh, way more international now than it used to be but still there were import players back then that uh, created that international flavor uh, but the, the USHL really back in whenever it was, 97, 98, um, 
it was kind of a mom and pop operation. There was maybe one or two people in the office and one head coach, maybe an assistant coach. And I think the whole league's just grown in level of professionalism and the amount of people that are involved and um, all, all good things for the players and, and the development of the league. You move on as most USHLers do to play collegiately at Union College. You wore the captain C your junior year there for the Dutchman. Unfortunately, had the career cut short by an injury at the end of your career, as unfortunately does happen to, to plenty of hockey players. It's an unfortunate circumstance, but a true one nonetheless. How do you feel that having to deal with that as a young man shaped you into not only the coach probably that you are now, but the man that you are now? Yeah, that was a situation where junior year, um, got some bad news, wasn't able to play uh, hockey anymore. I had spinal stenosis. I went in, thought I was getting shoulder surgery, no surgery, just you're kind of done playing. So that was a bit of a shocker because I think when you're going through that age, that level, you identify yourself with uh, the game and playing the game. And I wanted to continue on and play some minor pro hockey, wherever it may be at whatever level. So somebody was going to tell me I couldn't play anymore. And uh, you know, that was a situation that was a bit of a shock and we had an unbelievable coaching staff there, at union, Kevin Snedden and, and Kevin Patrick and those guys kind of brought me in under their wing and my senior season I spent on the coaching staff uh, which was a little awkward because I lived with the two captains on the team they were my roommates and we would go to the <laughs> rink and I would peel off to the coach's room and they peeled off to the locker room um, but again I just think it it really helped me uh, kind of formulate who I wanted to be as a coach and and uh, even at that time I didn't know if coaching was really the path that I was going to get into uh, I went back and I worked uh, back home for a little bit in, in the financial industry, and that only lasted about six months, and I was back to coaching. That was my next question. Was coaching always in your mind? Was it a byproduct of having your career as a player end the way it did, a mix of both? How would you formulate, and how did you formulate in your mind, the decision to jump into coaching, and what were kind of the lead up? What was the lead up to coaching for you? Yeah, I think the, the, the lead up was, you know, I, I personally wanted to get an education. I didn't think that hockey was going to be a, um, a career for me in terms of something that I could do for a long, long time and make profitable. I thought it was going to be something that I did for uh, a couple of years uh, because I love the game in terms of playing. And I went back and I started, like I said, working in the financial industry and I was there for a period of time. And at that time, I was coaching the U16 team for the Amateur Blues uh, with Scott Sanderson and his dad. They kind of brought me in, and, and we were working with that group there a little bit. And uh, What I realized is I love going to the rink way more than I love going to work. And so when the opportunity presented itself, um, you know, with some good advice from, from the Sandersons, I was able to, to jump back in and, and start coaching as a profession. And, and here I am, I don't know, 18, 19 years later. See, for the most part, guys just don't jump into being a head coach in the USHL, just like you don't just jump into playing in the USHL. You got to earn your way there. And you did that. You bumped around the North American Hockey League, the WHL. You actually were in France then, I read, for two seasons. Before we talk about the Sioux City Musketeers, I'd be really curious to know more about what it was like coaching professional hockey, your first stint as a, a full-time head coach in France. Yeah, well, you kind of went through the resume there. I think there's on the elite prospects. There's NCAA, WHL, North American League, League Magnus, OHL, AHL. So uh, able to check a lot of boxes uh, that way. Um, the, the way I ended up in France was I had spent eight years in the Western Hockey League as um, assistant coach, associate coach. Uh, I actually got to run – uh, the Everett Silver Tips for about half a season because Craig Hartsburg had heart surgery. So at the time, I was actually the associate coach. And you go through periods of your coaching career that you're like, I think I'm ready to go do this. You know, like I've had some really good mentors uh, over the years, and and uh, I was ready. And and what happened was is, you know, a lot of people were were. I was always in an interview process and they always said, oh, you, you don't have any head coaching experience. And I was like, well, how, I was always confused. Like, how does that happen? And I, I think it's just take whatever opportunities out there. And the opportunity happened to be in, uh, in Alger, France. And I, um, 
I jumped on a plane and, and we got to work over there and we had an incredible two years and uh, it, was, it was a good experience. What was your most memorable experience or what do you miss most about uh, going to France for a couple of years? The food? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the food was amazing. Um, just the, to be honest, the, the craziest thing in France that it, it took me a whole year to figure out is you, you actually don't play in one league. You, play, you have a league play. And then you had two massive tournaments that were going on, a lot like European soccer. So, like, uh, all the games were on Tuesdays and Saturdays, and the Tuesday games were, like, league games, and if you, or, sorry, tournament games. And if you didn't win and go on uh, deep into the tournaments, then you didn't play on Tuesday nights for a period of time. And uh, both years we had really good teams, so we were, we were always playing on Tuesday, and then we were playing on Saturday, and we were in league play and Coupe de League and, and – uh, uh, I was really confused for the first half of my, my time in France <laughs> and what we were playing for. So I kind of just said to the team, like, all we're going to try and do is win tonight. That's it. Don't yeah. worry about what we're playing for or what we're doing. <laughs> uh, let's just try and win tonight. And eventually, uh, you know, I, I figured it out. At the end of the day, isn't it always just that simple, though, right, Jay? It's just all we're trying to do is win tonight, this very night? Yeah, a little bit. Um, I think um, perspective in the American Hockey League has changed that slightly for me a little bit. It's, it's about win, and uh, at times we just got to develop players as well and, and try and find the best fit for those guys uh, to, to progress their career. And, and sometimes, um, you know, it's not always the pattern that you think it is going into the game. I think we have to be uh, open-minded as we're progressing through those games. So did you know any French before you went over there, or did you, had to, did you have to learn on the fly? No French. Uh, English-speaking locker room, uh, because there was players from all over. There was players from Estonia, Sweden, Finland. Uh, and then there's French players, and then there were Canadian players. So, um, you know, English was in the locker room, and then kind of when you walked out of the locker room, it was – we were in Alger, so there, was, there wasn't a ton of English going on, but I, I kind of found my spots and I was able to make it. All right, so once you finally get used to everything in France, then you decide to come back to U.S. soil and you go to Sioux City as the head coach. And what was your, your first thoughts on the USHL when you returned as a coach after, you know, almost a decade since you played last in the league? Yeah, I was just really excited, like, uh, Doc Gornett, Doc Ratz, and Lloyd Ney, uh, you know, the group in, in Sioux City there. I was the, I'm from St. Louis, and it was St. Louis ownership, so I was really excited to get back and, and work with a group of people um, with a lot of the same goals. I think, you know, they really wanted to come in, and, you know, you talked about winning a little earlier, and I think winning is important, and, and winning was important to them too, but more importantly, it was about uh, providing players with that opportunity to make their next step in their careers and their lives. And uh, we touched on a little earlier in this conversation, the USHL provided a lot of players, including myself, that opportunity to kind of transition to, from wherever they were at uh, through the USHL and, and into college hockey. And, and um, you know, I think that's a, that was a good lesson for me, just really finding people to work with that, that you believe in and you guys believe in the same things. Well, it looks like you did a pretty good job at that because you went 136, 88, and 16 in four seasons with the Musketeers. It's the third winningest coach all time in that organization's history, and that's a, a team that's been around quite some time. So what stands out the most for you when you're at, with your time with the Musketeers, and why did you have so much success? Uh, I just think great people to work with more than anything. I, I think people um, too many times kind of for good and for bad – uh, look at the head coach and be like, oh, that was your record while you were in Sioux City. And uh, more important than that, I think it was all the people that surrounded the organization that made it great. Again, uh, starting with their ownership and all the people that worked throughout the years <clears throat> with us together, our group, I thought was always strong. I, I, and I think there was change in that group where uh, pieces moved in and out. And, and then it was kind of find the next, the next guy who was up to, to kind of help with that culture and that development of those people. Tyson Event Center, a fantastic building down in Sioux City. 
when you would have played against Sioux City as a fighting saint, you would have played in the old auditorium. I've seen it, never with ice in it. I've heard legendary status about the old auditorium in Sioux City. Did you ever take the, the current players when you were there around that auditorium and kind of say, this is what it used to look like and this is what you used to have to do in this building compared to what you have now, which is Palisades compared to what the auditorium was? Yeah, what's crazy is like um, you don't get to feel like if you – I mean, I know if you're around and you go up there, it's, a, it's an amazing – it's called Long Line Center, so it's basketball courts and it can be tarped off and they're playing soccer up there and there's a, a climbing wall on the end by the old locker rooms. Um, so you, you don't get the feel of like how small the ice really was. And I think even when you play there – uh, you leave and, uh, you know, I never got back and saw it before they took the ice out again, but I don't even really, I just know it was tiny. It was, and it was hard to play in. And, you know, the old Sioux City Musketeers had Monster D and tiny forwards that would fly around the zone and you couldn't stop them. And you're chasing the forwards all night and running from the D all night. So, um, yeah, I wish... I wish we could put the boards up. I was uh, joking a couple times that we should play like a third, uh, you know, a neutral site game and bring the ice in and make the tiny boards up in the old odd and play a game up there. And people just rolled their eyes at me. So I heard you could score from almost anywhere on the ice in that rank. Is that true? Yeah. From, from my recollection. And like I said, it was a couple years ago, the red line would almost be the blue line in a rank today. So like, as you cross the red line, like anything from there was a good shot. Oh, that's good stuff. Um, talking more about the Tyson Events Center, talking more about the current status of the Sioux City Musketeers when you were there. Some pretty talented players that came out of that program during your time. Is there a most naturally talented player that stands out to you? And I know you had a few, but is, is there one or two players that you think of natural gifted talent? These two or these three had it. Yeah, to total gifted talent. Um, you know, guys that come to mind is like a pure shooter like Ellie Tolvanen. Um, you know, I think that that was a pure gift he had where he just um, – he was an unbelievable shooter. And actually on the same, the same team, there was another player that was just uh, – and there are a lot of good players and obviously guys that are playing in the NHL from, from that tenure that was just – extremely unique in terms of his natural talent was Christian Pospisil. And, and Christian was, uh, I would describe him a lot like uh, Dustin Bufflin in terms of he's a big man, he's a strong man, but he had the, the hands uh, of a really talented small player. And he did things that you just couldn't get the puck from him. So like on a, on a power play, you could just, he would just skate up the ice and kind of, did whatever he wanted it was it was unique um so I think naturally gifted players those are the two that come to mind right away is there a player or two that you remember thinking in the USHL I had to work really hard on this guy and you maybe butted heads with them but at the end of it when he moved on you were proud of where he got to and that doesn't even necessarily mean to be the NHL but is there someone that stands out to you as the person that you're maybe most proud of the work that you two did together helping him progress his career yeah I don't I mean button heads or no, we had a we had a lot of really really good players there the the player that I I had the most fun with was Adam Johnson because he had his own ideas all the time and and uh, Adam and I would discuss things quite a bit and um, you know he's a extremely talent uh, you know intelligent individual with a really big hockey IQ so uh, there was always some like deep discussion uh, with Johnson. Uh, he's having a good career uh, after college right now and, and doing good things. So uh, really proud of kind of our time together and, and kind of the laughs we would have or the looks we, he would give me maybe more than I would give him. This may seem like an easy answer considering where you're at right now, the AHL, one of the highest levels of hockey in the league, but you've coached at a lot of different levels. Is there a most difficult level that maybe you could, you could talk about coaching in? Is there one that stands out more than the rest or that they all have different trials? I think they all have different trials. Um, I think that's what's great about the diversity of hockey is, is every place that, you, that, that I've been has had a little different twist to it. Um, 
So there's a learning curve. You got to get in and you got to learn what the draft rules are, what the league rules are, how many imports you can have, uh, all the things that go with it and that, that are just kind of uh, basic things to a lot of leagues. And, uh, you know, it's no different than the American Hockey League. There's a veteran rule. And, you know, every second week I'm asking what the veteran rule is because, there, you know, there's this and that to it. And um, I think it's just for that reason, uh, the places I've been, it, it keeps you sharp and um, keeps you engaged. And like you said, I think there's just a little bit different twist to every league in terms of um, how you're managing the team or the rosters or, or whatever it is. So you have a few guys on your current Roadrunners team that you coached against in the USHL when you were with Sioux City, guys like Schmerick, Gross, Deneen. Do you guys ever reminisce or, you know, chirp each other about any of those times or do you remember those guys at all coaching against them? Yeah, I, uh, well, obviously I remember them because um, they were good players in the league at the time and you know, I think there is that the, the little camaraderie every once in a while. The problem is I coached against all our guys somewhere in another league almost. <laughs> yeah. so, so there's a lot of chirping coming my yeah. way. Um, you know, like uh, obviously I did miss a few of the guys, but um, there's a lot of that that goes on, especially with the, the, the USHL guys and the time we spent there for sure. So as either a player or a coach, what is – the one memory, what's your most memorable moment from your USHL days? Um, most memorable moment, um, I, I would just say, I, I think it has to be our, our team in Sioux City where we went to the finals and we, we lost in overtime to Chicago. I just, I thought that was a special group. I think you, um, I know this isn't one specific time, but I think it's a, uh, a moment in time where you have a group that, uh, everything's clicking. You got players in the right spot. You had uh, the whole team kind of pulling for each other. It was, uh, it was a pretty special group. Was there one moment of that series, aside from obviously the game winner in overtime from Chicago, that stands out to you? Uh, maybe a big moment for Sioux City that you think back on fondly? Yeah, we were, we were down in Chicago in the series, and we had a pretty good pushback uh, in terms of a win uh, headed back to Sioux City where we kind of got a little momentum going. So it was, uh, it was a hard-fought series, and I think it ended the right way in overtime of, of a game, deciding game, which is a pretty special way um, to play a series. What do you tell the team after that happens? It was a great run. I, I was proud of them. Um, you know, I thought those guys did a great job the entire time, the entire season, and uh, I just told them to – it's tough right now because it's not a good feeling. We're not skating around with the trophy, but uh, take a second to, to look at your friends because they won't be here next year. Everybody will be in a different place, and that's a pretty common thing in the USHL where a lot of guys were moving on, and I uh, just said in, enjoy the time because uh, we're here together for a couple more days, and then we're going to be moving on to, to something different. You stay in touch with any of those players from that roster? Yeah, I do actually quite a bit. Uh, I think in hockey, what's great is you just run into everybody somewhere, some way, um, you know, you flip a game on, on the TV and you're watching one of those guys play a different place, wherever it may be, college, another American league team. Uh, and then the texts come out and, you know, something goes back and forth. And uh, I think those are good moments. I think those are, what we talked about earlier in the conversation, just about relationships that you build that when you see players do good things or you see them play uh, somewhere else, it's, it's nice to kind of reconnect a little that way. I know it might be a little hard because you're a busy guy and everything, but do you ever find yourself following players that you used to coach? I mean, even um, from that team, you had guys like Matthew DeSay Fowle who led the league in scoring this year. You had Matt Miller who had an awesome year in Lincoln. Like do you take pride in any of that knowing that those guys were so young and maybe not the, you know, the top six guys back then, but now they're kind of stars in the league. Yeah. Um, obviously you check back in, you look at the leading scores, you look at goaltenders and uh, I was really excited to see Matty at the top of the league this year because I, you know, it seems like so long ago that we were bringing him in and, as a 15 year old and he was playing games and he was sitting in the office and, and um, you know, I, I don't know his complete career path, but he played on a couple teams in the USHL and, you know, he really found his home on that. It was a really talented Chicago team this year. We had tons of success and, you know, I, I just, 
remember freezing in one of those Bantam ranks, watching him and thinking this guy is, this guy's an elite scorer. Like he's, he's got something special. And it was, it was cool to see him recognize that in, in the USHL and, and hopefully uh, beyond. Last one for me, Jay, and I like to ask this to people who have been in the game as long as you have and have succeeded like you have. I think about the tug that Chris has had it, I've had it, you had it when you left hockey and then you came back to it as a coach. What is it about our game? And there are a lot of great sports out there with a lot of great brotherhoods and sisterhoods, but our game specifically, what is it about our game that keeps people in it for as long as we stay in it for? Well, good people more than anything. I think um, hockey just has a lot of really special people in the game. And I think the competitiveness of it. Um, it's a game that every night you have to be competitive. And if you drop that competitive level for one second, it doesn't matter where you're playing. Uh, it's the key to success. And I think with that competitiveness, there, there just becomes a bond uh, between the the players, the coaches, and everybody who's around the team, athletic trainers, equipment guys, who know the commitment that it takes to be successful um, on a night-in, night-out basis. So I think the, the foundation of those relationships are, are forged with, um, you know, a lot of competitiveness. Well, awesome. We really appreciate your time, Jay, and best of luck. Really appreciate your time, and, um, you know, we thank you for, for everything you've done for the league. Yeah, thanks for having me on, guys. Have a good one. Another great interview, as always, as we, I feel like we've always had the best guests we possibly can on, on the U Show podcast. But another great one, Jay Verity. Big thanks to him. Um, it, was, it was a fun interview, to say the least, like we always say. But uh, this one was, was true there. He's a, a good character, and he's a brilliant hockey mind. So it's fun to pick the brains of guys like that. And we learned if we ever were to disagree with Jay Verity to not mess with him because this guy has got some toughness behind him as well. I can only imagine playing for him. Uh, there might be some moments where you get that glare down the bench and there's some toughness behind the glare to go with it. But uh, truly a jovial guy too. And we had a blast. So big thanks to Jay and a big thanks to Adrian Denny with the Tucson Roadrunners for setting that up. Well, Ben, you got anything else for us? I'm trying to think. It's uh, almost the end of June. I can't believe how quick the summer has already gone. And it always goes quick, Chris, but I thought with COVID-19 protocols and, and guidelines and quarantining that it might take a little bit longer to get through summer. And I almost was kind of looking forward to that. But it looks like summer flies by no matter what's going on out in the world. So um, definitely looking forward to the 4th of July, though. Uh, that that's for sure. That'll be a big, uh, that'll be a big weekend for me. It's a big weekend for me and the family always. And I'll have to do that social distance uh, protocol wise, but otherwise um, that's kind of really all that's on my mind right now. And um, obviously waiting on pins and needles to see what happens, not only with the NHL, but the rest of the leagues in our league as well. Well, it's going to be an exciting week for the listeners too, because we have a special episode. We'll wait to preview that as it comes up, but a different perspective. It's got some military, um, involvement in it so um, to go along with the 4th of July so it's, it'll be a fun week and a fun episode on the 4th of July week so great teaser oh yeah always the cliffhangers so for Jay Verity and Ben Gilson I'm Chris Dreft and this was the U Show podcast this is the U Show podcast